Good morning. Good morning. What a beautiful week we had, huh? We're not in January anymore. At least not January in Montana. Maybe maybe Southern California. So, I, I had an interesting observation after last week's message. I want to share with you. Uh, I'm going to share you the observation, and I'm going to share with you the conclusion that I derived from the observation. Last week we talked about husbands and wives, and what Colossians has to say to husbands and wives. And uh, I had three husbands come and talk to me afterwards <laughs> about what a good message it was. <laughs> And one wife. <laughs> Which leads me to the conclusion that some of you weren't real happy with what I had to say last week. Okay. Except for the man. Well, thankfully, the wife that came and talked to me was my own. <laughs> I think we're okay. <laughs> um, we're going to, we've kind of stepped away a little bit from doing our testify. Uh, we're getting back to that today. So I'm going to turn this over to Dustin. I'm going to let him come up and share what God has laid on his heart. Well, hello everybody. As Mr. Earl said, I'm Dustin. If you don't know me, you should. I've been coming here ever since I was born. <laughs> <laughs> um, I quickly wrote up some notes last night, just in case I... I got the butterflies and couldn't remember what I had to say. <laughs> so, well, I grew up in this church. I grew up in a Christian family. Uh, I would go here most Sundays, except when it was hunting season, and we'd be camping or something. Uh, when I was growing up, I was a really re rebellious kid. I didn't like church. In fact, I pretty much could say that I hated it. I hated God and I hated everyone who went to church. I felt like they were weak for needing to trust in somebody else. Of course, I would say that I didn't believe in God, but it was just a falsehood to fool myself. Even though I eventually made a few friends here, I was never really myself around them. I would always go to church, put on a face, somewhat, and then go home and go do all kinds of stupid stuff with my two friends of the towel. Um, that was pretty much how my life was until 2007, when me and my two best friends thought it would be a good idea to steal a Super Nintendo. Uh, we got caught the next day, and the police got involved, and wasn't wasn't very pretty. So I was grounded for the whole summer. It gave me a lot of a lot of time to think about it. <clears throat> Started to helped me realize how much of a rotten brat I was. <laughs> and I started to realize how much people at this church were different from everybody else. There was just something, something about them. They were just always kind, no matter what you did. But even so, I, I still hated God. I didn't really pay much attention to Him. Just kind of made me wonder a little bit. Then, in 2009, me and my friend Xavier and another kid, I think his name was Bruce, he was just visiting, uh, <coughs> broke into an apartment because we had thrown a frisbee up on the porch of this second story apartment. So we decided to break in and get the first thing. Um, of course, me being an idiot, I decided that once 
Both of them were on the porch, I would close the door and lock them out on the porch. <laughs> so I kind of, you know, locked them out there, went down, looked at them, started laughing at them. Um, then, of course, that didn't take long before somebody realized what was going on, and we got in trouble for that. And, yeah, that, that also made me think probably even more. Uh, just what, what was I doing with my life? What, what was the point in all this? So, by then I was really contemplating what, what was going to happen. If I died, where would I go? Why, why am I here? Why is all of this real? And <coughs> admittedly, one of the main reasons that I was thinking about so much about it is because of that whole the world's going to end in 2012 thing. <laughs> <coughs> Even though it was ridiculous, it got me thinking. So. And eventually in 2010 at the youth rally, it was like, I think it was in October or something. Uh, the presence of God was so strong that I knew that I would not be able to hide the fact anymore that he was real. And so I gave my life to Christ that night. But of course, we all know that it doesn't stop there. Life keeps going and you grow in God. So, shortly after I got saved, uh, Mr. Van Oak started up the discipleship class on Wednesday morning. That consisted of me and Josh and Nick DeBoer. We, it, it was good. It, it really helped me grow in God. And also, another place that helped me grow in God substantially was at youth group. Uh, a big influence in my life has been Kevin and Christopher and Benjamin. Although, of course, um, it wasn't always just growth. I had my moments of stupidness. Um, I was really, really into gymnastics. <laughs> I, was, I was pretty good at it. And it pretty much ended up being my life. That's what I live for. Uh, the, the pride of knowing, of being so good at it. And so, God took that away from me by breaking my neck. Of course, at first, I thought, well, i got to get better so I can get back on the trampoline. But after about 12 months of waiting until I was allowed to, I realized that it really wasn't so important. And so, yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday school. <laughs> and it was a, a wonderful, beautiful thing to see the transformation. When he finally came to the point where he realized, I, I can't deny him anymore. And to see the growth. And, and you know, Dustin's very honest. Um, you know, sometimes he continued with his stupidness, but, but always gets back to his feet. And all, always trying again. And it's a, an encouraging thing to, 
to see a young man recognizing the bonnet and take steps to correct. So thank you, Dustin. I appreciate your, your honesty and your candor. Um, you know, I was I was talking with Christy earlier this week, <coughs> and um, I, I made an observation that people don't mind when you address sin generally, but they get real uncomfortable when you address it specifically. I don't mind if you talk about sin when everybody's involved, but don't talk about my sin to me. And, you know, we, we really struggle with being confronted in our error. And as a result, we oftentimes never move past that error. We're stuck there. And if somebody dares approach you, if one of your brothers obeys Scripture and comes and talks to you, we, we get offended. How dare you? You're not perfect. It's not about being perfect. There's only one that was perfect. That's about maturing. It's about growing. It's about honoring. And while we were having this discussion, I, I realized something that I've always known, but I never really put into words. You know, God is a God of positive reinforcement as well as a God of negative reinforcement. I was thinking as Christian and I were talking, I was thinking about when God had the nation come before the two mountains and he laid out the blessings and the curses. And you go, wow, because, you know, the first thing that I noticed when I read that the very first time, what did I notice? There are three times as many curses as blessings. Yikes! You don't want to make this guy mad. <clears throat> Why would God curse? Why? What is the ultimate purpose of God bringing difficulty into our life? Why does God allow hardship? Why does God allow sucky things to happen to his beloved children? <clears throat> Discipline, growth, growth, change. Because God doesn't want you to stay where you are. You know? As He walks through the garden of your life, He wants to trim away the nasty dead stuff so that the good stuff can flourish and grow and bear much fruit and be productive for Him. Oh, how we cling to the nasty dead stuff. But that's mine been a part of me as long as I can remember. Yeah, it's got to go. And so God comes and he speaks to us and he encourages us and he admonishes us and says, you need to let that go. And if we don't let it go, what happens? Things get, things get ugly. Ugly. And hard. And sometimes you even feel like God's abandoned you. Why? Because he wants you to grow. He doesn't want you stuck there. He wants you to move past it. I think about that when Dustin broke his neck and gymnastics was gone. You can't do it anymore. You, you take one bad fall and it's over. Why would God take something so pleasurable away? Why would God take something so good away? He nailed it right on the head. Because it had become his God. It had become rival in his life. And that's, uh, you know, it's horrible that we have to get to that point in our lives. But, that's my two favorite words, but God. But God. Dustin, God has got incredibly great things for you. Things that are going to make gymnastics look like rolling around on a mat. <laughs> he has got something unique, dynamic. He's got a call on your life. Because all that could have happened, and yet here you sit, you get up and walk up to the front, you're able to speak to us, communicate with us. God has a special, unique plan for you. Just as He has for each of you. Okay? 
So when God is bringing the hard things into your life, look up and praise Him because it's for your growth. It's for your betterment. And so that good things can come into your life. Okay? So, we're in Galatians. Uh, not Galatians, Colossians. <laughs> we might get to Galatians by, you know, 20. Oh, I did have a request after I finished this series. Thaddeus wants me to start at Genesis and do the same thing all the way through. <laughs> he said, Dad, do you have a plan for a message after Colossians? I said, yes. What about after that? Yes. What about after that? Yep. <laughs> Dang it. How do you take that exactly? <laughs> well, I thought for a minute. I was trying to figure out whether that was an insult or... Well, I guess that is you're just going to have to explain to me what you mean. Well, I was really hoping that you would just start at Genesis and go all the way through the Bible like you've been doing. That's not my plan. <laughs> Take a deep breath. <laughs> so we are in uh, Colossians chapter 3. <coughs> last week we covered verse 18 and 19. And I, I told you last week, I'm not getting... I have a series that I want to do on the family. Okay, So I'm, I'm, I know I'm not getting into as much depth. I know some of you are probably going to have questions going... What? Where do you even get that? Bear with me, okay? I'm trying to summarize something that God has threaded all throughout His Word, okay? And, and I'm trying to do it in just a couple weeks. So when, that's one of the three next series that I have planned, is going into more depth about families and family relationships and the dynamic that God wants in place and what. Okay? So last week, uh, we, we read uh, Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. We talked about that. How when you are reading scripture, you have to read intelligently. You have to read discerningly. You have to understand when God says, Husbands, if you are not a husband, what follows probably has no bearing on your life. He's not directing it to you. And when he says, wives, if you are not a wife, what follows is not directed to you. So, husbands, when God is speaking to your wife, let him speak to her. He's got it. He's capable. He's more than capable. Wives, when God is speaking to your husband, let him deal with it. Give it to him. Trust him. Okay? And this week we're moving on. We're going to talk about children and parents. Oh, I am so glad there's so many kids in here today. Oh my. I'm glad a bunch of you are on the front row, too. <laughs> so starting in verse 20, he says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Continuing on, he says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Now, one of the things that I, I brought up last week I want to bring up again. Paul did not write this letter with all these little subtitles in here. And one of the things that bothers me is I, I know in mine, the little subtitle right here says, Rules for Christian Households. It bothers me where they put that. Because the verse right before that says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, how many of you have that memorized? Whoosh! That was your memory verse for last week. You guys got to work on this. Got to stretch the old synapse. Okay? We have another one in, in the bulletin for this week. So, but what bothers me is he says this phrase, and then we get a break in our Bibles. Like, okay, go, go get coffee. Go eat one of those dry, crusty, cookie things that you're supposed to dip in the coffee, bis biscotti or whatever, <laughs> that are nasty. <laughs> Go eat one of those and feel culture because we've got to come back and get into more stuff. So we go and we have our break, and then we go through the rest of our day, and then we come back later, and, and we get into the next thing. And, and 
What we don't understand is that Paul never intended for there to be a break. And I say this because verse 17 matches verse 23. So to me, Paul is continuing one thought. He did not intend for this to be broken up. Whatever you do, do it as unto God. And then he goes into husbands and wives, and children and parents, and workers and masters. And then he comes right back to where he was. So see, I don't believe that that, that break should be there. I think that's erroneous. Okay? I understand it helps us to you know, catalog and, and you know, be very clinical about how we approach things, but I, I don't think that should be there. So, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Are we ready? <laughs> Children, what is that word? In the Greek, this is an interesting thing. This is a concept because there's two things that I need to address here today. Just like last week when we talked about husbands and wives and we realized that it was two sides to the same coin. You can't do one without the other. Although you're still responsible for your side of the coin. The way it works best is for both sides to be there. Okay? That's how God intends it to work. For both sides sides to be there. We talked about, you know, <coughs> wives you, you submit and what does that mean? And we talked about husbands love. What does that mean? And how when both of those are together and they work the way that God intended, how beautiful a thing it is. Right? Well, we have the same concept in this next phrase. Children and parents. Okay? Children, obey your parents in everything. So children, now, now interestingly enough, I was a little bit surprised when I was going through and I was doing my study on this. Because the word for children is not based off of the root of pedagos, which is, you know, where we get pediatric. Okay? That's, that's where we get the word that deals with kids. That, that's not what it is. It's techno. Now, you go, well, big deal. What, I mean, it's children in the English. Well, the, the problem is the idea behind the word. Because... While children does convey the word, it doesn't convey accurately enough. Technon literally means offspring. Okay? Well, well, children is offspring. That fits, right? But the problem that I have is children sets an age limit. Because in our minds, we go, children, and what <laughs> age does a child quit being a child and grow up? Anybody? 21? Okay. 18? Uh, 12? Yeah, I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. But we have this abstract idea that at some point they take this big step and they're no longer a child. Okay? And if the word was pedagogos, I, I would agree with that. I would say yes, that's accurate. That's, that's entirely accurate. Okay? But it means offspring. And it can even mean lineage of offspring. So like generations. So like when they say, our father Abraham, and we are all children of Abraham. They're talking about all the generations that come down. Wow, okay. So I was very surprised to see this because this opens up, this word changes really what I take as the base meaning of this. So let's deal with the base meaning, and then we'll get into some other things. Base meaning, children. Let's just start with that abstract idea of before they become adults. And we'll put it somewhere between 12 and 40. <laughs> Five. <laughs> that gives me a year. <laughs> children, obey your parents in everything. Now, the word obey is very similar to the word. Does anybody remember the word that I gave you last week for submit? Does anybody remember what that word was in the Greek? That's okay, don't worry. I'm, I'm not going to grade you down on this. Hupotasso. Okay. It's a military term that can also be used in a little bit different reference in Tavuni. Now, the word for obey the children is related to that word. It's hupotuo. And it's, it's kind of a unique twist. Because the word literally means to listen, to hearken. The idea is someone knocking at your door, and you go to the door to find out who it is, and you listen. Who is it? UPS who? 
okay? It's to pay attention. And we have this idea, and, and I'm, I'm saying this because I want to clarify what the passage is really saying. Because I have this idea, when I first read this passage, all right, kids, <clears throat> you got to do what I say. <laughs> Back road for dad for the next six hours. <laughs> That's not what it's talking about. Because see, there's the verse that follows at the flip side of the coin. My burden is to not exasperate my children. To not discourage them. To not dishearten them. Dang it. <laughs> Six hours is character building. <laughs> <Be disheartening. laughs> so, children, hearken. Pay attention to your parents and everything. Why? I mean... I know my parents didn't have it all together. They blew it a lot, especially between 13 and about 20. My parents blew everything. They didn't understand anything. I had it all. And then something happened and I got stupid again. I had children and they reminded me how I didn't have it all. Father, you have no idea of which you speak. You foolish man. There is no need to make my bed, for I shall be in it promptly, and I will mess it again. <laughs> silly, silly man. <laughs> I don't like green beans, Father. They provide no nourishment to me before I run to the bathroom and vomit them up. So what is the point of even swallowing? <laughs> you silly, silly man. And I realized, I have no clue. I don't know. God help me. God created an incredible dynamic when he built the family the way that he did. You know God didn't have to do it this way, right? God could have done it anyway. Imagine if we'd been amoebas, and I'm up here giving a message, and all of a sudden half of me falls off and walks out the door. <laughs> not a believer yet. <laughs> I mean, think about it. God could do it however he wanted. He could have made us like starfish. Hey, honey, I was thinking about having a child. Can I lop off your arm? <laughs> it's going to grow into a child, and you shall love it, and it will be just like you. God could have done it however he wanted. But God created something beautiful. And he created a husband and a wife to love each other, to be willing to sacrifice of themselves to have children that pooped and vomited and disobeyed. And God gave those children to the parents to steward. He entrusted them to the parents that they could grow them, that, that they could teach him all about God. That was his intent. That was his intent. That these would be my caretakers, the stewards. I mean, why did God put Adam on the earth? Why? To steward the earth. To be the husband of the earth. To take care of things. And then he gave him Eve to help him with his job. Because his, ta his task was too great. And then he made them reproductive. And they had children. And the dynamic is incredible when you think about it. Yeah, you know, I gotta tell you, some babies are ugly. <laughs> I'm sorry. None of the babies in this church ever. <laughs> <laughs> and if, as soon as an ugly baby walks through that door into this church, they become a beautiful baby. <laughs> but some babies, but there's something about a child, isn't there? A, a little baby. It doesn't matter how their head's kind of, you know, and and they got those weird blotches and. Things and, and they smell. <laughs> Isn't there something about babies that just softens the heart of most people? There's just something about them. I, I think God did that on purpose. Because if it was really that ugly, you'd never change it. You wouldn't beat it. You'd be like, okay, three minutes worth of crying and you're done. But God designed this. He implemented it. Now, sin has come in. It's corrupted it. It's warped it. It's changed how it was supposed to look. It's made it disgusting. And, and I mean, you read the news. 
And some of the things that I see that parents do to their children and children do to their parents is disgusting. And I think it's an egregious offense before God. But that wasn't God's plan. That wasn't his intent. You guys understand that God loves children? Do you understand the passionate heart that he has for children? Read his word and pay attention to how he talks about children. What an offense it is to him when people mistreat them. Even in, I'm not even talking about in the New Testament because Jesus said, you hurt one of these, it's better to take a millstone, wrap it around your neck and jump into the deepest part of the lake. Better for you. But even in the Old Testament, God's wrath was kindled against those who mistreated the orphans. His heart is compassionate toward children. He loves children. Now, why do you think he says, blessed is the man whose quiver is full? God thinks children are a blessing. He thinks they're cool. He likes them. In Mark, I was surprised by how many times Jesus dealt with kids. As a matter of fact, at one point, the disciples are, shh, 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 leave the master alone. He's busy. He's doing important adult stuff. He's teaching. He's expounding on the things of God. Go away. And Jesus said, no, 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 let, let, let them come to me. As a matter of fact, Mark even goes so far as to say he picks one up and holds it. I, that's just a compassionate picture to me of God's heart towards his children. And he entrusts parents with something that he values and cherishes that much. Wow. So kids, obey your parents in everything. Why? Because God gave them to you to teach you, to instruct you so that you could grow, so that you could become of value, so that you could be productive, so that you could be a blessing. Well, how the heck am I a blessing by washing my dad's car? Come bless, come bless me and wash mine. That's a blessing. My dad loved his car washed. I mean, he would have us out there every Saturday if weather permitted. And it wasn't so bad, except that my dad used undergarments for rags. <laughs> And you're out there in your front yard with a pair of skibbies wiping down the car when your friend drives by. And you're just like, you just keep going. Don't. Oh, I got dibs on the sock. <laughs> but it blessed my dad. It blessed my dad to, to have his car washed. And I'll tell you what, you wanted to move on my dad's heart, you did it yourself. You didn't wait until he asked you. You just went out and washed his car for him. Why is it important for kids to obey? Why? You know, I don't know why sometimes it's important for kids to obey in certain things. In my, in my family, we have a rule. Nobody in my family has to eat canned peas. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Christy opens that can and I said, no. <laughs> the smell. <laughs> Cauliflower, broccoli, green beans, corn, all that you guys gotta eat, sorry. Fill it up. Nobody has to eat peas in my family. Now, in your family, your kids might have to eat canned peas. If so, I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, in the greater spectrum of things, do they eat peas or not eat peas? Is that significant? Well, yeah, actually, it is. Why? Because it's teaching them to trust you and to follow you. And how can they say that they trust and follow God when they don't trust and follow those that God has put in charge of them? Hmm. See, the, the thing is, if, as children, you're in rebellion against your parents, what does that automatically put you in rebellion to? God. Automatically. You don't get to make excuses. You don't get to come before God and say, yes, but. There, there are no buts. You think God's ignorant of your situation? You think God knows I mean, but God, they wanted me to eat canned peas. Pastor Glenn doesn't make his children eat canned peas. That's why I didn't put you in Pastor Glenn's family. Because you need canned peas. <laughs> See, it's a training ground.
It's a development center. It's a place for our children to grow, to learn, to take what they've learned from us and be able to apply it with how they deal with God. And one of the greatest articles I ever read was actually very revealing to me. It was an article by Keith Green, and it was called The Father Heart of God. And it talked about how, in a survey, um, they determined that most people view God the same way that they viewed their father. And I was stricken when I read it because I realized I did. Remember how I told you I was the redheaded stepchild in God's kingdom? And I used it for years. I would stand in amazement and I'd stand in the corner of God's throne room and I'd watch Christy crawl up in his lap. And I was jealous. And I couldn't understand it because I was never the one to go up on his lap. And it took me a long time to realize the reason that I wasn't crawling up on his lap was not him, it was me. I was the one that was not coming out of the corner and crawling up in his lap. His lap was big enough for both of us. We take those things and we apply them to how we see our father. Now, children obey your parents in everything. Now, parents is, is an interesting word there. Okay? Um, see if I can get this right. Gonias. Gonias. And it literally means parents. There's not really any other definition for the word. It's just parents. The parental units. So when God is saying children obey your parents, he's not saying children obey your dad because he can whoop the tar out of you. Or obey your mom just when she nags you to the point where you're tired of hearing it. He's saying obey them. Jump, chip, snap. Both of them. You know, I lived in a family, I grew up in a family where my mom never said, wait till your father gets home. <clears throat> my mama, she had a stout arm and she had a stick. <laughs> I hate to this day, I hit those little rubber balls on the rubber band and go, biggie, 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 biggie. Yeah. <laughs> my mom used to buy one for each of us and there were five of us. And as soon as the rubber band broke, biggie, 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 biggie. guess what mom got? <laughs> Oh, she got a paddle. That was up until I was about eight. And then she decided those were not sufficient. And so she went and got a one by four and cut a handle out of it. Okay? Spare the rod and spoil the child. There was no spoiling in my family. Because there was no sparing. Because if somebody did something and nobody fessed up, guess what? Five people lined up in a row. I didn't do it. Well, you did something else. Boom. <laughs> and you got it. Okay? God disciplines his children. He teaches us through our parents what that discipline is for, that we might grow. Do parents get it wrong? Oh, yeah. We get it wrong a lot. I and mean, nobody ever said we were perfect. And children don't ever expect that your parents are going to be perfect. If you think they are, Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> we'll have family therapy. Some parents are better than others. Would you ever have that friend whose parents were just like awesome? Was like you just wanted to be adopted into that family? Could you give me their name? But I never had that. Uh, my parents were pretty, pretty straight up. I had good parents. Uh, you know, I had one, one friend that his parents, you know, if he got a D or an F on any of his report cards, he was grounded till his next report card came out. Even if it was over the summer. And so one summer, I had to ride my bike all the way up to Mark's house every time I wanted to be with him because he wasn't allowed to come out of the yard. Um, I had another friend that uh, they got beat with the strap on their bare bottoms. I got to keep my pants up. Yeah, I'll take any cushion I can. <laughs> God's not like that. Okay? We need to understand that our parents do the best with what they got. Sin has corrupted this thing. God intended it to be perfect. God wants it to be perfect. God implemented that so that we can understand how our relationship with Him is supposed to work. Yeah, there's good things. There's good things that come. If you're a good parent, you have all kinds of positive reinforcement. We have an expectation in our family that our kids get straight A's. That's a requirement. Why? 
You go, <gasps> straight A's? Yeah, yeah, straight A's. Why? Because they can. Why would we expect less? If you can get an A, why would you settle for a B or a C? And so we have a rule in our house. If your grade dips, you're grounded. You know, no TV, no games, nothing like that. Can you bring your grades back up? Because obviously, you've had straight A's. You can continue to have straight A's, so there must be a problem with focus. Let's help, us with the, help you with your focus. Okay? I know some people go, wow, you guys are hard. And most of my kids have had straight A's their entire life. Okay? They don't very often get grounded. Very rarely do I have to ground them. Am I hard? Yeah, I'm hard. Why? Because I expect good things from my kids. Well, I tell my kids, why do I expect straight A's? Because I want you to have options when you graduate. When you graduate from high school, I want you to be able to choose to do whatever you want. If you want to be the BFI guy, the guy that drives on the trash truck, because we had one kid that wanted to be the BFI guy. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to be the guy that hung on the back and rode down the street and picked up the trash and dumped it in and then hung got the right on the back. He wanted to be a BFI guy. Well, you're going to be the best educated BFI guy there is. <laughs> but you still got to have straight A's. But that's your choice. If that's what makes you happy, great. But I want you to have the choice. Because if you do that for a couple weeks and realize, oh, I stink all the time. Nobody wants to hang out with me. <laughs> I want you to be able to do something else. You choose to work at manual labor or some other job, fantastic. Great. I always have jobs that need done around the house. <laughs> but I want you to have the option to go ahead. So children, obey your parents, both of them. Now, I want to talk a little bit about adult children. Because you notice there's no, no age limit here. We put the age limit on it. I, I heard everything from 12 to, well, I, 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 I kind of jokingly said 40, but I, I think I heard 21, 24, somewhere up in there. Okay. Where do we come up with that number? I mean, honestly, I arbitrarily kind of said it when they started out of my house. When, when they got out on their own. Hey, it's all your problem, buddy. There you go. Is that how it works? Is that at which point they don't have to obey us? That they don't have to... Uh, I'm not even going to use obey. I'm going to change this. I'm going to say hearken. Where they don't have to listen to us? Where they don't have to... What's that? What are you saying? What, what age does that happen? At what age do you have to, are you allowed to just quit listening to mom and dad? Anybody? Never. Yeah. Yeah, see, never. This was a hard lesson for me because I realized when I was going through the study, I actually started the study about three years ago. It was very difficult for me because I realized that I had, when I turned, man, I was out of the house when I was 17. I'm done. Bye. From 16 to 17, I spent quite a bit of time out of my house. Because dad and I didn't get along. And so he, we'd get into a fight and he'd kick me out or I'd leave. And then at 17 I went to college and I was done. I was out of the house. And looking back I realized how wrong I was. The, the, the sin, the affront that I had given my parents. The, the prideful, arrogant attitude that I had. Um, <coughs> You know, my parents had to deal with me. And that was no easy task. I tended to think it was easier because I had an older brother. I had Todd, who made things very rough. I thought I was pretty easy compared to Todd. But I, I wasn't easy. I was moody. Uh, I, I, I was, had a bad temper. I moped. And, uh, I was, I was proud. I had a lot of pride in my life. I thought I knew how things were supposed to go. I knew the best way to get things done. And I've had to spend a lot of time before God repenting of my sin. I, I spoke with my mom and dad and repented before them for my attitude. And, and they, were, they were incredibly, incredibly gracious to me. Because they could have been like, yeah, I told you so. But they didn't. They were very gracious to me. The same... One of the things that came to mind, if you would uh, flip with me to 2 Timothy, I want to read something to you.
Paul is writing to Timothy. We're in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 1. He's warning Timothy of things to come. He says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. Did you guys catch what was nestled in there? Did you guys catch that? Lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, treacherous, tucked right away in there. It says disobedient to their parents. Now, if you apply even rudimentary skills of logic to the reading of this passage, you understand that Paul is not taking a little parenthetical statement and talking about adults and then just inserting a little comment in there about children. He's, he's speaking to the same continuum here. Okay? He's, he's not taking a break to address a, a separate issue and then coming back. Because for years I've read, I read this passage and I would read adult, 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 children, adult, 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 adult you know. That, that's why I read that. Because I didn't want that to apply to me. Even though as an adult I was disobedient to my parents. But that's not really what Paul is saying here, is it? How old do you suppose these people are? Well, obviously, they're old enough to be um, out of the house, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, <laughs> lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness. What, is, what, what age group is he talking about? He's talking about adults here, people. He's talking about people like you and me. And do you catch what it says right here? disobedient to their parents. Do you see how God is dishonored in this? Do you see how God watches this and goes, no, you cannot do that. This is how I desire it to be. Now, I'm going to stop here because there's a lot more that I want to say, but I'm, I'm going to flip the coin over. I'm going to flip the coin. And there's some unique things here that I want to address. And I, I know we're, we're drawing close on time here, so I'm going to come back to this. But I want you to understand, children, technon, offspring, okay? There's not an age set in Scripture. <coughs> this isn't the pedagogue's word. This isn't talking about those that are in your household, those offspring of yours that are still under a certain age. Okay? But now it says, fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Now, I find this very interesting because here he tells children to obey your parents. But then he turns around and he specifies fathers. Okay? This is Peter. This is the dad. Okay. Uh, on occasion, this is used for, in a general sense, kind of like uh, mankind. But specifically, this is Peter. It's, it's speaking to people like me. Like the father of the children. Okay. So, wives, moms, I don't know why you're let out on this one. I have a suspicion. I personally, I think it's because women tend to be more encouragers. And fathers tend to be more exhorters. Okay? When, when your child is learning to ride a bike and they fall off the bike and they scrape their knee, dad puts them back up on the bike and gives them another push. And mom comes out and bandages the boo-boo. Okay, moms tend to be encouragers. Fathers tend to be exhorters. Fathers also tend to not be as involved in their kids' lives. Fathers tend to be the heavies. We're just here for when things need correcting. I, I don't know how that worked in your family dynamic, but it took Christy and I a long time to work out that she could discipline the children. That I didn't have to be the one to discipline the children. Because Christie's approach is about negotiation. Let, let's, let's talk this out. Women, you like to talk. God made you that way. You like to talk. But sometimes, 
talking with your children is arguing. And the discussion goes too long. They're showing disrespect. They're showing dishonor to you. <coughs> but fathers, I don't have discussions with my children when I give directives. But dad, how well does that go over, guys? <laughs> Not well. She follows with get the stick. That's right. <laughs> I, I know I'm a brutal father because I made these movies. Let me explain. I didn't do that to be torturous to them. I did that for a reason. The stick was always in the same place except for when Christopher hit it in his toy box. It was in the same place. And when there was a punishment that was deemed necessary to get a squat on the wrong, I would tell the kids, go get the stick. Okay? That gave them time to think about what was going on when they went there, but it also gave me time to think about what was going on when they went to get it. And it gave me, you know the slow count to 10? But I tell you, when you tell your child to go get the stick, you got a really slow count to 10. <laughs> and all of a sudden they're walking like this. <laughs> okay? And it gave me a chance to calm down. And when they went out of the room, it gave me a chance to talk to Christy and verify is this right? And sometimes she would say, no, I think we're not really getting the story. So they would bring the stick back, they'd give me the stick, and then I'd say, okay, explain to me what's going on. Because I wanted them to understand why they were going to get a smack on the bottom. I did bad. Okay, how, I, I, we understand you did bad. That's the whole point of this. But what did you do specifically? Okay. That, so there was go get the stick. But when I speak to my children, I tend to be an exhorter. You want to see dad get really hot, one of the siblings speaks disrespectfully to their mother. That gets dad really angry very quickly. And for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to affect her that way very often. So why is this being addressed to men? I, I think because men tend to be the heavies. We tend to be the ones that respond physically most often mm -hmm. and react. Okay? Now what does he say here? He says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Now let's, let's look at this real quick. I'm just you know, doing a little word study here. It says, uh, to provoke, to stir up, to excite, to provoke. Okay? And then to be discouraged, to be disheartened, to be broken in spirit. Okay? Now, see, there's some explanation that's required here. Because we have this phrase, Do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And I guarantee you, if I were to ask the dad to write down what that meant, what the boundaries were, and I were to ask your children to write down the same boundaries, I bet you they'd be very different. I bet you they wouldn't be the same. So let's put everything on the same page here. It's going to be different from child to child. I'm going to say that up front. I'm going to be honest. Because I had one child, actually I actually have two, that all I have to do is look at them. And that's punishment enough. Dad looks over the top of his glasses at him. <laughs> I'm sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> okay. I have three children that were not like that. I had three that were a little bit more strong-willed. I had three that sometimes, you know, I only have one child that I ever needed to swap twice. He's teaching Sunday school. He's teaching Sunday school. <laughs> but I won't tell you who it was. <laughs> he was very strong with okay. And we had to make a determination as to how to focus that, to channel that without breaking his spirit. Because it, it, it would have been very easy to break his spirit if you just keep thumping him. Uh, you will do what I say. I don't want to break the spirit. I want to channel it. I want to take all that strength and focus it. Make it usable. Make it applicable. So, how do you not discourage your children? Well, I mean, the first thing would be to do the opposite of that. Which would be what? Encourage. To encourage your children. Well, how do you encourage your children? You find out what's going on in their life. And you, you encourage them along in it. You know, one of the things that I tell my children about their straight A's. I do not have any stupid children. I don't. 
I don't have any ignorant children. We're fixing that. That's why they have to have straight A's, so they don't remain ignorant. They, they, they gain in knowledge. Okay? Sometimes I have foolish children. That's where we, we correct, we direct. We want to fix things. We adjust things. Encourage them. Be a part of what is going on in their life. Yeah, they have to be a part of what's going on in your life. My family vacationed every year by camping. Okay? Every year, we would go camping. And we went to two places. We went to Sunbeam Lake while we were in California, and we went to Bonnie Reservoir when we were in Colorado. Those were the only two places we ever camped. And, if at all possible, we put our tent in the exact same spot. <laughs> and you wouldn't believe the frustration when my dad pulled into the little circle where the camping, and there was somebody there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember one year we came in and we came in early because dad wanted to get a good spot and there was somebody in our spot so we circled around and we went to the other side which was away from the lake and we parked on the other side the next day the people left and what did we do we packed everything up and we drove around the circle and put it in the dad's spot okay every year we went camping we were a part of my you know quite honestly I don't camp anymore I like my bathroom I like my bed I like to wake up in the morning without my body hurting. Okay? So I don't go camping very often. We went camping because my dad loved to camp. Okay, so they, I had to be a part of what went on. Be a part of what your kids are doing. Okay, now, now I want to clarify something. Don't live vicariously through your kids. Don't, don't do that. What I mean by that is, oh man, when I was in high school, we went to the state championship and you know, if coach had put me in fourth quarter, we'd have won it all. So you gotta be a good football player. You gotta go to state, you gotta take it all. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not telling you to live out your dreams through your children. Yeah, expect things from your children. Expect good things from your children. Expect hard things from your children. That's how they grow. But channel that in the areas that they grow. Remember the, the passage in Proverbs says, train up a child in the way that he should go? You know what that literally means? Train up a child according to their bent. Okay? Now, I have an oldest brother that's a baseball player. He was good. He was very good. But we went to baseball everywhere. And we were in California, so they played baseball year-round. I don't much like baseball. I have another brother that played football. And we did, we got to do the same thing with football. I played soccer. Okay? I love soccer. Um, I, I, you know, my sister, I don't think she ever did a sport in her life. Now that she's older, though, she plays softball, she coaches soccer and softball and basketball, and she does all kinds of things. But, but see, the thing is, if my parents had expected each of us to play baseball, I wouldn't have done one because I, I wasn't a baseball player. I was okay, but I, I wasn't interested in baseball, according to their bent. Okay? Train up a child according to their bent. Now, keep in mind that they still have to be trained in righteousness. Okay? So if their bent is to, you know, head into sin, no, that's not that's what they're talking about. That's where you start pruning. Blop. Cut that out. Okay? Train them according to their bent. Be involved in what's going on. Be an encourager. Encourage them in the things that they like. Um, Thaddeus, he just whipped his head around because he thought he was in trouble. <laughs> Thaddeus makes games. He invents games. He, he draws his own game boards, pieces, rules, and, and he's, he's done probably eight or ten games that he's made. Now, a lot of times, I don't understand them. And I'll do something he says, you can't do that. Well, I did that last turn. Yeah, but this is this turn, and you have to do it this way. Oh. And do I tell him, you know what, don't even do your games. No, because that's something he enjoys doing. Now, I want to encourage him in that. Maybe one day he'll make the, the next Yahtzee, or the next Monopoly, or the next Life. I don't know. Mackenzie doesn't make games. She doesn't. But Mackenzie likes to cook. Mackenzie likes to play the keyboard and likes to sing. As a matter of fact, she'll walk around the house singing all the time if I would let her. <laughs> when do I tell her to stop? When she sings the same four words over and over and over and over and over again. 
After I've heard them about 36 times, it's like, okay. <laughs> Sing something else. <laughs> okay. Be a part of what's going on in their lives. Encourage them in that. I guarantee you, if you are encouraging them in something, they're going to start doing better in that. They will be so involved in what you are encouraging them with that there's going to be very little time for them to do stuff that you'll have to discourage them from. Now, this is why I think he's speaking to fathers. Because moms do this oftentimes. But fathers don't. Fathers are busy. I worked all day. I come home, I'm tired. I want to put my feet up, get a cold drink and watch a game. Read my paper. Okay? Remember, you are part of the two that created this child. Man up. Embrace your responsibility and father. As a matter of fact, let's say dad. Any fool with the right biological assets can be a father. But it takes someone with heart, responsibility, with effort to be a dad. Okay? So dads, don't discourage your children, lest they become disheartened. Lest they just, I, I can never do anything to please him. I, 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 I give up. I give up. Okay? I really was hoping that we would be done in chapter 3 today. <laughs> we will be done next week. So, children, obey your parents. Hearken to them. Listen to them. Hear what they have to say. Because they've been there. They've done it. They've got the bruises and the scars. Dads, be encouragers of your children. Lift their spirits. Engage them. Be part of what is going on to them. Be, be, be a part of what's important to them. You know, one of the things, I'm, I'm just going to take a, a detour here. I just want to share with you. I, I don't remember the exact percentages of it. No, I'm, 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 I'm guessing. I know I'm, I'm pretty close. But they did a study on kids that stayed in church and left church when they moved out of their family's homes. And they found that about 54%, and I, I might be off by a couple points, but it's about 54% of the kids who had both parents in church stayed in church when they moved out. And they might have left for a while, but they, they came back. They were, they were regular church attenders, 54% who both parents attended church. When <clears throat> only the mom attended church, what was really interesting is that number dropped a little bit. It dropped to about 47%, 46 47%. It actually decreased. When dad didn't go to church, but mom went to church and she took the kids to church, that number dropped to about 46%. Now, neither of those things really surprise me because I've seen what goes on in a lot of churches today. But what shocked me, what absolutely floored me, was that when dad was the only one that went to church, when dad took the kids to church, that number jumped to almost 72%. When dad took the kids to church, 72% of them stayed in church. Dads, you have a lot to offer your kids. You have an incredible blessing, a calling of God. He has made you significant and of value. And our culture <coughs> has lied to you. And they've said you are not, that we don't need dads. We, all we need is mom. We need the nurturer. That's a lie. We need both. Dads are vital to the healthy growth, the maturity, the spiritual well-being of their children. They're necessary. They're vital. God designed it that way. He orchestrated it that way. So dads, when I tell you to be an encourager, I don't mean just in sports, just in scholastics, just in hobbies. Be an encourager in the spiritual things, the things that are eternal. Let them see you reading the Word. Engage them when they're reading the Word. Find out what they're reading about. Engage in discussion. 
It doesn't have to be already involved. It doesn't have to be a theological discourse. Just let them know you're interested. That you're there with them. Let them see you pray. Let them see you pray with your mom. Let them see the two of you pray for them. Not against them. Oh, God, smite that child! <laughs> God, bless my children and lift them up. Grow them in you that they might one day become a leader for you. A mighty man of God. Let them see you fellowship. Let them see that church life is important to you. That getting together with the saints is important to you. Let them be a part of that. Uh, quite honestly, when you're standing around with the guys, talking about hunting or logging or, or whatever is going on, whatever football team, they, they, most of the time the kids aren't going to be involved. But there's going to come a time where you're going to look around and you're going to see your kids standing there watching. Invite them in. Bring them over there. Let them hear what's going on. Shouldn't have anything to be ashamed of, right? Right? This is how we encourage them. This is how we grow them. This is how we don't do what he's warning us against here. Okay? Be involved. Be committed. Be there for the long haul. When I was studying psychology in school, Christian psychology, don't freak out. There was a diagram that, uh, there were a series of diagrams they had asked parents to draw what they saw their children's teenage years like. And the most consistent drawing that people did in some form or another was, you know, a stream with a waterfall. <laughs> this is the teenage years. And I had a teacher that, that actually would correct people on that. She would say, no, it's not a waterfall. It's the rapids. And she would redraw it. And she would show that things get rough, things get bumpy. But there's another side to that. And it will come out and it will smooth out. And that's when they all of a sudden realize, oh, my parent, my parental units weren't quite as foolish as I thought they were. They, they kind of had it a little more together than I gave them credit for. Wow. My dad was a genius for not making me eat canned peas. <laughs> okay? Hold on. Hold on. 